All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids, and I have to say I am super excited about this webinar. Um, I think it's fascinating to learn about sharks and their relatives that we know very little about. The, the deep sea is an amazing world. Um, and Dr. Brett Finucci uh, gets to study it and has found out some really interesting information about uh, some very weird and wonderful animals. And so I'm really excited to have her here with us tonight to talk about this. Uh, Britt is originally from Canada, but is currently living in Wellington, New Zealand. So it's morning for her over there. And uh, she's working as a fisheries scientist uh, there. And she's, I'm not gonna talk about her favorite species because I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna, without further ado, uh, I think you guys, this is gonna be really interesting. Again, I'm super excited. Please put your questions in the Q&A. I see some people are already doing that and I'm gonna let you take over. So welcome, Dr. Fernucci. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you for having me. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, all right, so just make sure I have this correct. Screen looks okay? Looks great. We are good to go. All right, perfect. All right, so I'm going to give you all a little introduction about chimeras. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have heard about them. Some of you may not. Um, but hopefully by the end of this, you um, will love them just as much as I do. All right, so first up, a little bit about me. Jillian's already given a little bit of an introduction. Um, but as she mentioned, I was originally born in London, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, it's about two hours from Toronto. It's where I was born and raised. I did my undergraduate in, uh, at the University of Toronto. And one day I decided to pack up and move to the other side of the world um, to live in a country called New Zealand, which happens to be that little island off, um, off Australia. And I've been here for about a decade now. Um, so I've done my master's and my PhD uh, here in Wellington. And I currently work as a fishery scientist at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, uh, which we call NIWA. Um, as well, I'm a member of the IUCN Shark Specialist Group, and I'm currently the president of the Oceania Chondrithian Society, which is our regional, um, essentially our regional group of shark nerds. But enough about me. I know you guys want to hear some more about some weird and wonderful sharks. Um, so just a little bit of background on what we find here in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand chondrithian diversity uh, includes over 112 species of sharks, rays, and chimeras. Uh, we do know that there are more species that are still out there. We are still describing new species. Uh, so that's why our number is expected to grow. And despite being quite a small country, uh, we do have about 10% of the global fauna. So of all the sharks and rays and chimeras in the world, uh, New Zealand has about 10% of them, and we have quite a high number of endemics. Um, endemics meaning that uh, these animals are found nowhere else in the world. So about 20%, one in five species of sharks, rays, or chimeras found in New Zealand are found nowhere else. And um, the majority of our sharks are deep water, um, which is fantastic for me because I like studying weird and wonderful things. And New Zealand, we've got everything from some of the smallest sharks in the world right up to the biggest ones. And the ones that we're going to focus on today are our chimeras. So what is a chimera? Uh, well, you heard me mention the word chondrithian before. And chondrithian um, is a group of fish that are different from other fish. Um, in a nutshell, they have a skeleton made of cartilage, not bone. Um, so fish like tuna, they have bone skeletons, but uh, chondrithians are different. Um, so we have cartilaginous fish, and there's three groups within these chondrithians. You have your sharks, your rays, and chimeras. So chimeras are shark relatives. And altogether, we've got over 1,200 species of sharks, rays, and chimeras around the world. That number is increasing all the time. But going back to the chimeras, Chimeras, uh, you might know them by different names. Um, they are called different 
things throughout the world, uh, apart from being chimera. Um, we do call them a lot, some call them ghost sharks now, kind of a cool name that catches on a little bit better than chimera. Um, they're also called rabbit fish, uh, rat fish, spook fish, elephant fish, pearl fish, uh, elephant shark. There are a lot of different names that these animals are known by. And what makes a chimera different from, say, your regular shark, say your prickly dogfish, which is, um, of course, the best shark out there? Well, for one, the internet seems to love chimeras better. Um, recent posts that I've put up on Twitter of a chimera did about four times better than um, my recent post on a frilled shark. And I thought frilled sharks were pretty cool, but it seems that the internet likes chimeras better. Uh, but getting back to the biology, um, chimeras, for one, they have uh, essentially um, their jaws are fused to their skull. Um, so it's just one big bone. Whereas in sharks, uh, their jaws are not fused. And I know it's a little difficult to see in that photo. It was, um, it's hard to find a photo that really showed it. But um, um, yeah, um, chimera jaws fused to the skull, um, which gives them a really strong, powerful bite. Um, which they need um, for chewing uh, their prey. Uh, chimeras eat a lot of um, benthic crunchy things like crabs um, and other little um, echinoderms and oh, all sorts of um, all sorts of little animals you find on sediment on the bottom of the ocean. Um, so they require a lot of um, breaking down these animals. Uh, the second big difference between a chimera and a shark. Um, chimeras have tooth plates, unlike sharks, which have rows of teeth. So these tooth plates, um, they look a lot like uh, rabbit teeth, which is hence why they're often called rabbit fish. Um, and these are ever growing tooth plates. Um, they are not replaceable. So sharks have rows of teeth. Um, when they lose a few teeth, they get new rows uh, that come through. These tooth plates, these chimeras have them their entire lives. And Another difference that we see in chimeras are what's uh, called a tenaculum, or sorry, a group, a tenacula, a group of the a tenacula is called a tenaculum. And these are a feature found only on male chimeras. Um, it is used for reproductive purposes, and the males have a tenaculum, tenacula, sorry, uh, three places. They've got one on the top of their head, which is what you see in the image there. And they've also got a pair of them um, near their uh, pelvic fins. And these tenacula, they, as the animal becomes mature, they erupt from the body and they become hard and calcified. And, they're, and I know it's a little difficult to see from the picture here, but they're really, really sharp too. Um, and it's thought that the animals, the males, use these um, appendages to latch onto females when they're wanting to mate with them. Um, it's a really weird structure. Um, I've never seen a chimera mating. I don't know if there's video out there yet, um, but I imagine it's quite a unique sight to see. So in a nutshell, that is a chimera. And chimeras, um, they're found everywhere. They're found in every ocean except the Southern Ocean, um, so around Antarctica. However, here in New Zealand, uh, we have recorded them just a few degrees above uh, the, what we define as the Southern Ocean. So, you know, they might be down there as well. We just haven't found them yet. Um, but yeah, chimeras are everywhere. And at the moment, we know there's a 52 species. Um, again, that number is expected to grow as we um, explore new places, as we explore new depths, um, and as we get better with our genetic techniques and looking more at the taxonomy of these animals. And within the chimeras, um, there's three main groups, which I'll go through separately. And um, each group is defined uh, by the shape of their snout. Now, the first group, I've got a video here, I'm hoping it'll play. All right. Uh, so the first group is the Calorancidae. And these are known as the plow nose chimeras. Uh, so you can see their, their snout is it's quite different in shape. It's essentially a plow. Um, and they use that. Um, unique feature uh, to find prey items in the substrate. Um, Plowno's chimeras are the only shallow water species of chimeras there are. Uh, there are three species which are found around the world. We have 
one species here found in New Zealand and Australia, uh, one is found uh, around most of South America, and the final species is found around Southern Africa, so in Namibia and South Africa. All right, the second group of chimeras are the chimeridae. So these are your short-nosed chimeras. Uh, this is the most diverse group of chimeras, um, sitting at about 41 species um, known today, depending on who you talk to, depends on how many species you think there are, but um, they are growing in numbers all the time. These are found everywhere. Um, these are some of the deepest chimeras known, getting, uh, they have been reported at depths greater than um, 2,000 meters, um, which I think is about 6,000 feet for those that um, use the imperial system, but don't quote me on that. My conversion rates are quite difficult to deal with um, first thing in the morning. Um, and our last group is the rhino chimeridae, and these are the long-nosed chimeras. These are my favorite, um, super funny looking. Uh, we've got eight species that are again known throughout the world um, and what's fantastic about these guys is that obviously they've got very long noses and um, these uh, as juveniles their nose can um, equate to about 50% of their entire body length so these are massive snouts that these animals grow into as they get bigger and we're not 100% sure what they're using these long noses for. Um, we uh, assume that some of them use it uh, to, again, detect prey um, in the substrates, uh, like the elephant fish do. Um, but there is some um, evidence to suggest that it might be uh, associated with mating. So males tend to have uh, different growth rates to their snouts than females. Um, and one of the species that I've looked at so whether that is a reproductive uh, characteristic of some animals, we're not entirely sure. We've got to start observing these animals more in their natural habitat. Uh, but unfortunately, that's quite difficult to do because as deep sea animals, uh, they're very hard to, um, to get to. Um, they live in places that we just can't get to because it's expensive, because it's deep, because we're not actually entirely sure where they are. Um, some of these animals are only known from a couple of specimens ever recorded. Um, so some of them can be very, very rare. Um, but what's fascinating about chimeras, in my opinion anyway, is the diversity in color. They're just beautiful animals. Um, they, you know, they get, they can be pure black, they can be pure white, some have spots. Um, they have these amazing iridescent color. Uh, there's purple ones, there's blue ones, there's silver ones. Um, they come in just a diverse range. Um, of species, of sorry, of colors, and it's just amazing to see these animals up close. Um, and our chimeras, they are oviparous, um, so that means they lay eggs. Uh, the females, they can produce two eggs at a time, um, which they um, lay in the substrate. Uh, we think that these eggs can take up to six months. Um, sorry, the embryos within the eggs, can, which you can see in the top right-hand photo there. I've got a better photo on the next page. Um, but we think what the, the embryos stay within the eggs for about six months um, before they hatch. Um, and chimeras, um, again, we don't know a whole lot about it because we don't um, observe this in the wild too often. Uh, but the females, they lay two eggs at a time um, for a good period of time, like possibly months at a time, so they might be producing quite a few eggs. Um, and again, these eggs can come in a diverse range of shapes and sizes. Uh, for those of you that live near a beach, um, you might have ended up seeing particularly um, this black, uh, this dark one here. If you live around New Zealand or Australia, might be, these are from elephant fish. Um, and you might see those wash up on the beach every so often, uh, like other skate eggs do. Um, so as I mentioned, this is just, um, this is uh, the development of this an elephant fish, uh, just shows you the different stages as the animals get bigger. Um, so these, like, it's kind of similar to what you see in a chicken egg. Um, the embryo has a big yolk sac that it feeds off of, and as it gets bigger, the yolk sac gets smaller, 
uh, to the point where the animal has consumed most of that yolk sac, um, and then it hatches and it goes out into the world. Um, and when they're born, they are pretty small. Um, they fit in the size of your, um, or they fit in your palm. Um, this long-nosed chimera, that would be, uh, it's definitely a young in a year. Um, so it was born sometime, so it's less than a year old. I'm not entirely sure how old it would be, but um, it was near hatching size. It was about 17 centimeters in length. It was pretty small. Um, that hand there is just to give you a comparison of how small they are uh, when they first uh, hatch. Um, but just to give you a comparison of how big they can get, um, this is a giant chimera. Uh, it is one of the bigger chimera species that we do have out there. And this is actually a small giant chimera. Uh, this is an adult male. Uh, females get a lot bigger. Um, but this guy still weighed, I was weighed about 12 kilos, which is 25, 26 pounds. Um, so he's a big, heavy fish. Um, one of my favorites now, he's quite a goofy looking animal in beautiful purple color. Um, they, we find them just around New Zealand. Um, not too common. Um, that was the first one that I've ever seen. So it was a really special moment. Uh, we saw him, I was out at sea in January. So that was a, an amazing thing to check out. Um, but what else do we know about chimeras? Really not a whole lot. Um, there's a lot we still need to understand about these, uh, these guys. Like I mentioned, we've got 52 species now, but we know there are more out there. Um, so the diversity, we're not sure about. We are changing and um, identifying new species all the time. Age and growth, um, we have no idea how long these animals live. Uh, we can't age them. Um, we haven't found a way to do that yet. Um, so that's a very important aspect of their, their life history that we need to figure out. Um, prey and predators, uh, for some of these species, we know a little bit about what they're eating. Most species, we don't know. Um, predators, again, get the occasional sighting of an animal eating uh, chimera. I've seen um, leopard seals around New Zealand that are eating chimeras. So yeah, there's still, we just, um, how they fit into the environment, there's still a lot of unknowns there. Um, population size, their movement patterns, um, important habitats, where they're laying their, their eggs or where they're mating. All these species, we just don't know. Um, but in my opinion, um, and this is the work that I kind of work on, is the fisheries interactions and importance to people. Um, these animals are caught as bycatch in a lot of fisheries, so that means they are not intended to be caught. Um, but unfortunately, when you stick a net or um, a long line down the ocean, you can't always select what you want to catch. Um, so sometimes they do bring up chimeras and they can bring them up in big numbers. Um, so we need to make sure that we are not having any adverse impacts on these animals. Um, and for some societies, chimeras are an important source of food. Um, they are, uh, some animals are used for their liver oil. Um, so they're, um, they're, they're very important for, um, as, a, as a resource for some people as well. Um, so it's important that we make sure that we are taking care of these animals so they can take care of other societies. Um, but yeah, I think I'll leave it at that and let you guys answer some questions. Uh, if you do want to keep in touch, best way is to find me on Twitter. I am the only, probably the only Brit Panucci in the world. I've never found another one, so I'm pretty easy to stalk. Um, I like to post weird fish on, um, on my Twitter, so that's the best place to find me and find more of these weird fish. Cool. Well, thank you. I think it's really interesting, and we've had a, a couple conversations um, about deep sea species and, and the challenges of of learning and it seems to be a very common thing and we get a lot of questions and the answer is we just don't know and for you guys watching out there that is also exciting because it means if you're interested in this um, you might grow up and start studying sharks chimeras um, and you might discover a new species or find out one of those questions so it's really um, it just shows you how much exploration of our oceans there's still left to do um, so I think that's that in itself is super exciting um, and uh, obviously challenging, but also really, really interesting. So um, we have some great questions. Uh, first one, though, I like to ask people is 
what is your, I, you kind of hinted to it, so I know the answer, um, <laughs> but what is your favorite shark? Favorite shark, apart from the chimeras, is the prickly dogfish. And yet we did see an appearance on that presentation there. Um, I've talked about prickly dogfish before. There are these little sharks we get around New Zealand, Australia. Um, they're called prickly dogfish because they've got super prickly skin. Um, they're quite dopey looking. They've got big eyes. They've got this tiny little mouth. They get big, big pot bellies when they've eaten too much. Um, yeah, they're, they're my favorites. Yeah, they're, they're very cool. And, and you guys, what we might do is tomorrow actually post, uh, we have a coloring sheet, kind of a fun fact sheet, because um, I too love them because of Dr. Finucci and, and really kind of learned more about them. And yeah, if you see them, they're just incredible. Um, yeah, what a cool, fascinating um, animal. So I can definitely see why uh, they're your favorite. All right, do you have a favorite chimera species? It's a good question because a couple months ago I probably would have said the long-nosed chimeras, but after seeing the giant chimera um, in January, I think I might be converted uh, to the giant chimera. But yeah, no, there's as a group they're just stunning. The color, the colors on them is just I can't get over that. They're unreal. And if you Google, there are a few videos of chimeras out there um, with deep sea exploration. Um, occasionally they do. Um, find chimeras and they're stunning to watch them um, in the water too. They just kind of float around like butterflies. Um, so yeah, if, if people want something else to, to Google on YouTube, um, check out some chimera videos as well. Just watching, yeah, the way they move is really interesting as well. It's just so uh, different from, you know, what you think of sharks and rays when we're talking about. And uh, yeah, and we saw, like you showed us the different colors where I had no idea. I hadn't really looked at them all kind of lined up together like that. And you really see the, the difference. So very cool. Um, Zach would like to know, what is their skin like? Their skin, so they don't have denticles like, uh, like sharks do. Um, so sharks sometimes can, um, the, the, you, you're told that they kind of, they, sorry, my brain's still waking up. <laughs> um, they, um, they're like sandpaper with chimeras. They're very smooth. Um, they actually, like, they actually can be quite difficult to pick up because they're very slippery. Um, so holding that giant chimera was actually quite a difficult task because not only was it heavy, but uh, it was constantly sliding out. So they, yeah, you could say very smooth, very slimy. A lot of people say they're just slimy, but um, yeah, very soft. They've got a lot of species have deciduous skin, um, meaning that it actually it um, it falls off quite easily. Um, so a lot of chimeras, if they're brought up by um, a trawl fishery, they don't look anything like those images I showed you. Those beautiful um, pure black species. A lot of them, they're quite they look quite gnarly looking. Um, unfortunately, just because of the the way their skin is, um, but slimy. I would go slimy. Slimy is a good word. Right. Um, let's see. So then we had, which kind of you've mentioned, um, and I, I don't know, I assume maybe it's the biggest or one of them, but uh, Thomas asked what the biggest species is and, and how big do they get? Do we know how big they get? Um, yeah, so the giant chimera is one of the bigger ones, um, which has been recorded to, I think it's 160 centimeters. Um, oh, geez, in feet, that's five, between five and six feet. Um, in length. Um, giant chimera might be the heaviest one because it's got this massive, massive head on it. Um, but there are other species uh, like Hydrolagus affinis, which is found uh, right across the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's also a species found off of South Africa, Hydrolagus um, erythicus, uh, which again, they probably get to about the same length, uh, but I don't think they're as stocky as the, the giant chimera. Um, but yeah, just, just under two meters in length is what the biggest ones get reported to. All right. A um, couple people have asked um, if, the, if they eat each other. Do we know that? Because uh, I think we talked, in a couple of the talks, we've talked about sharks being cannibalistic um, or sharks eating other species. Is that something that is even known about this animal? I know there's one record of um, a chimera eating another chimera. Um, it was an old paper. Someone mentioned that they looked in the stomach of a big chimera and found a little one. 
Um, so it's it's definitely happened once. I wouldn't be surprised if it um, if it's more common. I've had I've seen little um, chimeras that have what looks like bite marks on them, um, and it looks like it could be another chimera. Uh, it's very difficult to tell, but um, yeah, it's definitely possible. I mean, it's 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 another fish to eat out there, and if a fish is hungry enough, I'm sure it would go for it. Um, and Kylie wants to know, do you ever put, because again, we've talked about tagging lots of different species of sharks. Do you ever tag the chimeras to kind of learn movement or depth or things like that? I haven't, not yet. Um, that is on my to-do list. Um, there's very few studies that have actually tagged chimeras. Um, part of it is probably because of the size of the animals. Tags are quite big and heavy and a lot of chimeras are quite small and um, probably just be too much for the animals. Uh, but there have been a couple of acoustic um, surveys. So that includes, or that um, involves putting a little transmitter within the chimeras. And there's been um, some work done um, off the coast of Southeast Australia, I believe, as well as around um, Washington State, which has looked at two species. And they, they recorded that, um, actually quite different. Some animals, they stayed quite close to home. Um, some animals traveled quite a big dif distance. Um, so it gave us a little bit of insight in their movement. Um, but yeah, virtually no chimera studies out there. So that's definitely another thing that is on the, on the list of, of research we need. Yeah, and I would imagine, you mentioned their skin kind of sloughing off a bit or being, and a lot of the tags, especially external, I would imagine might come off very easily if they weren't, I mean, if, you know, if they weren't placed just right, or that's got to be one of the challenges as well of, of just having the right equipment that will actually stay on the animal. Yeah, exactly. And with sharks, you know, there's all those, those tags that they actually screw into the dorsal fins of these animals, and that's not an option for chimeras. Um, they're, they're, yeah, they're quite fragile. Uh, so yeah, something we need to figure out if anyone's good with inventing yeah, Thanks, by all means. And that too, I think, is just if you're interested in studying sharks, it might not always be from a biology perspective. It could be if you're an engineer um, yeah. or you mechanical, things like that. Because, yeah, we're seeing a lot of technology that is either developed for studying these animals or is something that's used for completely different things. But somebody went, wait a minute let's try this and it actually is really useful. So I think that's, that's super interesting for, for students out there, people out there that um, might not necessarily be um, interested in the biology aspect, but are you know, more mechanical minded. Um, I am not at all, but yeah, the people that develop and build things. And yeah, so I mean, that's definitely a, a cool approach. Um, all right, yeah. so Lindsay has a couple of questions. Um, First is how often are you at out at sea and what is your favorite part of your job? Um, I've only been out at sea once in the past few years. Uh, we don't do as many surveys as we used to, um, but I'm hoping to go out a little bit more. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite uncommon, but uh, when we do go out, these surveys go out for about 30 days, um, which is quite a long time to be away from from land, um, people start to get a little crazy at about day 19. For some reason, that's the day. So I've been waiting. I've been waiting for everyone um, here in lockdown to kind of go mad once we hit day 19 here. Um, but the favorite part of my job is probably going out to sea, just because it is an it's an opportunity that not many people get, and the the things you see out there are just unreal. These weird deep sea creatures that. Um, you know, people you see photos of, but you never actually get to see in real life. And um, I always find it amazing that a lot of these these ferocious looking deep sea animals are actually incredibly small. They all kind of fit in the, the palm of your hand. Um, so they look, you know, the internet and makes them look like monsters, but you get out there and they're just tiny, tiny little fish. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I love, I love playing with fish. I love getting my hands dirty. Um, that's my favorite part of my job. Um, Pascal, and you kind of mentioned the size, but Pascal wants to know uh, what the smallest um, species is and maybe the size of that one. Smallest species, um, probably, oh, 
There's a few. There's one species I can think of um, off the coast of Brazil, which I think gets to about 50 centimeters. Um, it's a little difficult to tell because uh, there's quite a few species of chimeras that are only known from you know, a handful of specimens. So whether or not that's their true size range or that's just the animals that we've seen so far, um, it also depends on the, the, fr the frustrating thing I find with chimeras is that each region has a different way of measuring them. Um, so it's, there's a lot of converting between measurements. Some people measure the whole animal. So I don't know if you saw, but chimeras, um, a lot of them have this extended tail filament, um, which is, is, is really cool. And it adds quite a length to the animals, um, but that can break off as they get bigger. Um, so some people measure, measure the animal with the tail filament. Some people measure it without. Um, so it's quite, it's quite difficult. And you, yeah, if it breaks off, then you don't know exactly how long that animal was to begin with. Um, but yeah, some of the smaller ones, about 50 centimeters, so about a foot and a half, two feet, not even. Um, yeah. Oh, big one. Um, and then you mentioned they're caught in bycatch. And we've had a couple of people ask, do humans eat chimera? Because we've also talked about sharks and shark conservation and what's happening. So. Um, you know, do they eat them or what happens to those that are caught as bycatch? Yep. Um, yep. So there are some chimera fisheries out there. Um, they are some of the more sustainable shark fisheries. Um, chimeras seem to have a higher reproductive output than a lot of sharks. Um, so they are able to withstand fisheries, um, fishing, sorry, fishing pressure. Um, here in New Zealand, the elephant fish, it's a common recreational fish. Um, so a lot of people go out there and collect them themselves. I, I, I'm a vegetarian, so I've never tasted a chimera, but I've been told they taste all right. Um, some people love it, actually. Um, and yeah, if you catch it yourself, you can find it occasionally in a shop. Um, I have seen it uh, labeled as pearl fish rather than, you know, say, ghost shark or whatnot. Um, and yeah, so there's fisheries here in New Zealand and Australia. Um, people eat the elephant fish in South America and Southern Africa. Um, off India, there's a species that is caught quite a lot of. Um, it's um, one of the long-nosed chimeras. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a fish. People do eat it. Um, yeah, and we try and, for here in New Zealand, we do try and utilize any bycatch that we do get um, to minimize waste. So yeah. That's great. Um, who wants to know, when did you start studying Chimera and why? Why Chimera? What was the interest? I didn't really get a choice to be honest. Um, when I, I started studying Chimeras when I started my PhD and I when I first got into sharks I wanted to study more of the big pelagic sharks and talking to some of the scientists here, they're like no 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 we need research on deep water sharks because we don't know anything about them and I didn't know anything about deep water sharks so I thought they were all a little mad um, but that was what I was told I was going to do and the species I was going to work on um, depended on what we caught actually um, so I was when I first started my PhD I went out to sea on one of the trips and we kind of left the, um, the species I was going to look at um, we left it open and we'll see right we'll see what we catch on this trip and then you know that's what you'll work on and the species that we caught most of was chimeras so that's how they kind of fell into my lap and um, at first I thought they were incredibly odd but it didn't take long to convert me to realize how amazing these creatures are and how few people work on them and how, how we do need a lot more work on them so yeah yeah it was not by choice but I'm glad it happened. Cool. Um, Khadija would like to know what they eat. I know you said that there's still a lot of that information that isn't known. Um, but is there some start of, or you know, any idea even for just one species of what their, their diet might look like? Yeah, uh, yep, so the, the species we have in New Zealand, um, we've done actually a decent job of looking at their diets. Um, it's very difficult to look at their diet um, because when you look at a chimera stomach, it's just full of tiny little bits and pieces. Um, as I mentioned, they do use those tooth plates to essentially grind everything down. So you're left with just shell fragments and 
bits and pieces of everything in there. So it's a lot, it's like a puzzle. We have had to kind of try and put these things back together to figure out what they're eating. Um, but we do find a lot of crustaceans, um, like crabs. Uh, we find echinoderms, we find gastropods, um, the occasional fish. Um, not sure if they're actually hunting fish or if they're just picking them off the ground. Uh, squids as well. Um, so they have a very, very diverse diet. Um, yeah. Do you think it's probably in the deep sea, like they might be a bit more opportunistic than more specialized? Just, you know, do you think that's you're seeing in, in some of these animals or? It's, yeah, it's hard to tell. So I've, I've talked to one scientist who thinks they are, they have very specialized diets in certain places. Some species are found, um, they kind of hover around hydrothermal vents. Um, so I think they're just eating the species that are around there. But yeah, in the deep sea, there's not a whole lot of, well, in a lot of places, there's not a whole lot to eat. So when you do find something that's edible, you just eat it. Um, so yeah, whether that's the case for chimeras, I think, yeah, they do have a diverse diet group and they can as they get bigger too we notice that their diets do change as they get as the animals get bigger they're able to eat bigger prey items um, so yeah I think they are quite opportunistic and Theo age six um, I think you kind of mentioned this but what was the deepest um, depth the chimera has been found at either I guess coming up in a net or if a submarine has seen um, you know do you have a is there a, is there a deepest species? Yeah, I knew someone was going to ask this and I meant to look it up just in case, but I believe the deepest record is 2,600 meters and I don't know what that is in feet, yeah. like 7,000 7, feet maybe? Let's see, 2,600 meters to feet. That's about 8,500 feet. So there you go. yeah, wow. Yeah, That's some of them do get very, very deep, um, but most, a lot of them you find less than a thousand meters. So 3,000 feet. Um, Incredible. Yeah. Again, some of them have very, very wide depths range. They're found like from the surface uh, right down to like 1,000 meters. Incredible. Um, mm. And then we have, Khadija would like to know, do we know if they live together or if they're more solitary? Both. Um, so there are some species that we only really ever see one at a time. Um, and there are other species we get massive groups um, again around New Zealand there's a couple of ghost sharks that um, yeah if you see one you're seeing hundreds and hundreds of them together what they're doing we don't know um, they could be you know just hanging out there because there's a good food source um, it could be an area that's important to them like that's where they breed or lay their eggs um, but yeah you, you get a little bit of both it depends on the species um, are there any, uh, Caden would like to know if there are any aquariums or zoos that have chimeras? Or, I mean, are they a species that is kept in captivity? Yep, um, yep, there's, there's a few, I've been to a few um, aquariums over the years that have had chimeras. I think they rotate, um, so they might not always be on display, um, but I've been to the aquarium in Lisbon and Portugal, which had um, the Chimera Monstrosa on display, uh, the Georgia Aquariums had um, Hydrolycus coleoi, so the spotted ratfish, which is very common around, um, around the US, that one's been on display. Um, I believe the Seattle Aquarium also has Chimeras. Um, where else have I been? The Toronto Aquarium did have Chimeras on display at one time. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of species that they do very well in captivity. Um, and yeah, it's just a matter of making sure you take a look for them. I've, I've seen them in, in the aquariums and no one's ever looking at them. So I go running up to them and just, oh, they're all mine. Um, so yeah, sometimes they are there. You just got to keep an eye out for them and ask, um, if you do go to aquariums, be sure to ask, um, ask the people that work there too, because they might have them there. They might not just be on display at the moment. Okay, cool. And then we're going to finish off with one last one. Um, you know, you've mentioned that there's a lot of questions that are still unanswered about these animals. Is there one specific question that you find most interesting that that would be like finding out that answer is, is really what kind of 
drives you or, you know, that would just be like, I don't know, you're the ultimate um, in your research? That is a good question. Um, ooh, that's a good one. I think I would have to pick movement patterns. So yeah, so some of, some of these species are very widespread across the ocean. And I'm very curious to know if, you know, they, they don't look like these animals can travel very big, you know, have great migration patterns. But um, yeah, I think I'd want to know whether these animals are, you know, truly traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles and kilometers, or if they're just hanging about in their local area. So yeah, I think that, that would be my answer, but that's a good one. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, first up, thank you to everyone that joined and sent in the questions. Um, hopefully you're just as excited about these animals as um, I know I want to learn more. Um, I just, I think they're absolutely fascinating. And I think it's really interesting that we know so little and, and your work is, is really incredible to, to kind of see. Um, uh, definitely check out Dr. Fenucci. She does post some really cool stuff on Twitter. I can attest to that. I enjoy those images because they're not things that you're going to see all the time. It's not a white shark or a hammerhead and, and very obvious and easy to get photos. So I think you'll, you'll really enjoy that. And, and thank you, Dr. Fenucci, for taking the time to, to share all this information and your research with us. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, stay tuned. We have a couple more sessions tomorrow, but thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you guys.